In this episode, we are going to be reviewing Lifeboat from 1944. This was directed by Alfred Hitchcock. It was written by John Steinbeck and Joe Swirling, and it has a wonderful ensemble cast, which includes Tallulah Bankhead, John Hodiak, Walter Slezak, William Bendix, Mary Anderson, Henry Hall, Heather Angel, Hume Cronin, and Canada Lee. Welcome to Robert Bellissimo at the Movies. This is a YouTube video podcast where I explore movies from all over the world and talk about how those stories were told on film. I want to welcome back Joel Guns to the show. Joel is an independent scholar. He is known as the Alfred Hitchcock Geek. He is an award-winning filmmaker and editor and publisher of Hitch Geek Magazine. He's produced and directed three Hitchcock-themed, critically acclaimed documentaries, How to Watch Hitchcock, Freak the Geek and Alfred Hitchcock, Master of the Surreal. And he's also the co-host of the annual HitchCon, which is a conference dedicated to the films of the master of suspense himself, Alfred Hitchcock. Joel, welcome back. Thanks so much for doing this. Hey, thanks for having me. I've been excited to do this for a while. And so uh, looking forward to what we're going to talk about today. Well, me too, because, you know, I must say, I must say this, this may be my my favorite or one of my favorite Hitchcock films. I just think it is, it, it, it's, it's criminally underrated in my view. And I, it's so powerful in terms of story, character, feelings, uh, value of the piece, everything. I just think it's absolutely fantastic. And I'm curious, when, when did you first see this and, and has your, feelings about it changed with repeat viewings by any chance? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I think the first time I saw it, I was probably maybe 18 or 19 years old. And, uh, and I saw it in the theater on, on oh. film, oh, you wow. know, back in the, back in the eighties, like we watched movies on film and, uh, and I saw it and I loved it. And then I've seen it, I don't know, maybe a dozen times since then. And each time my estimation has grown of this film, uh, so then we, just in pre preparation for this conversation, uh, Christy and I watched it again, and um, absolutely like this, uh, this time, uh, I, I feel like the word masterpiece has to be applied to this movie. Absolutely. This is an absolute masterpiece of, of filmmaking, storytelling, everything. It's, it's got it all. It's, it's running on all 10 cylinders. Yeah. Yeah, no, I totally, I totally agree. You know, it, it, what, what's interesting about this film is that it's not so, it's not so simple, at least for me afterwards, like preparing for this podcast to think, okay, how can I, how can I kind of talk about the essence of this story? Because there, there's, there's so much in terms of, you know, psychologically what's going on with all these various characters on this lifeboat. And of course, you know what I was saying about the war at the time, but it is is what what do you see as the greatest value of the piece? I mean, is what when you walk away or think about this film, what do you see it as being truly about? Well, I think there are a couple of things. One, well, three things. Uh, it's one of Hitchcock's four single set films where the right. entire film is is play, made in you know shot inside a, a single setting with no movement right outside of that uh and so how he secondly then how he kept it visually interesting so the cinematography the uh just the mise-en-scene the the editing is is also uh, just very masterfully done. There's not a boring, I don't even think there's a repeated shot in the whole film. When you stop and think about it, that's sort yeah. of amazing. And then yeah. finally, um, the uh, I, I think his, his philosophy and uh, dare I say a, a political view is, is expressed in the film that uh, was incredibly courageous for the time oh, yeah. and, and makes it absolutely universal. So even like right now, watching this this film, it's about World War II and the the ambiguities of, of the conflict between East and West. We're seeing that uh, played out right now in the in the Ukraine Russia war, yeah, yeah. and and how we're aligning our loyalties with nations for uh, possibly for good to 
uh, drive an, an invader out, but we're also seeing other alliances formed that are more pragmatic, at least on the Western side, that make us, uh, uh, they, they seem to be necessary for the moment, but they're also provoking some thought about uh, what uh, a real politic uh, situation looks like in the 21st century. So mm. a movie that um, came out in 1944 and it's still as current as today's newspaper. I think that qualifies for universal praise. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it, was, it was very, you know, cause I, I know that one of the big controversies of it at the time was that they were, I, I mean, I, I, I think I think people felt he was being sympathetic to the to the German character, but I don't see it as sympathetic. I see it more as empath empathizing with not only him, but with with everybody in the boat's uh, point of view, because, you know, the irony is that this guy who is the reason that they're on this boat to begin with is because he was the guy who torpedoed them. Uh, and, uh, you know, as we saw at the top, he, all these people get into this lifeboat and one of them is the Nazi who's captain of the other, the submarine. And he's the reason that they're, you know, potentially going to die. But then he's saving them at the same time. You know, the one character, Gus, has uh, gangrene. He's the one who amputates him and, and saves him. Uh, he was also, he was also capable of, um, you know, being the captain of the boat, so to speak, and he's row, he's doing all the rowing and all the all the work. When that storm comes, he kind of he saves everybody. So he's like, you know, he's he's you know, your your feelings go kind of back and forth with with everyone, but him the most because he's ultimately saving everyone, but then at the same time plotting <laughs> how to get them over to the German side, you know, because they're trying to get to Bermuda. And, and he's lying to them. You know, you see, he says he doesn't have a compass and he's hiding one. Um, and, you know, of course, what comes into play is the fact that he uh, uh, is drinking. He has water. He has food tablets. And they're all starving and, and thirsty and re ready to kill each other because of how thirsty and hungry they are. So it's really interesting because I... I I felt as though I could I could understand his point of view because he's not going to trust them and he's not going to want to help them, even though he's making them think that he is because, you know, he, he didn't have a choice that he was captured on this boat. But you can understand why he'd want to get them on to the German side and save himself. And, you know, perhaps he was someone doing his job. Uh, with the torpedo and like I know Tallulah Bankhead's character she was a little more uh, sy sympathetic towards him saying well you know we don't know these people and maybe they were just doing their job and stuff like that so I I actually thought that was fascinating because for me a lot of World War II films they will depict you know a clear antagonist and a clear protagonist and you know the Nazis you know of course, rightfully so, are the antagonists. But you know, there's where where is the you know where is the shades of gray, right? And and as we know now, the war falls more in the shades of gray. There was a lot of compromising. There was a lot of uh, collaborating uh, from different countries with the Nazis. So it's like you know we know who the the true bad people were, but unless we empathize with them, we can never understand their evil whereas here we understand his evil because yeah. you see his point of view i don't know if that was your I, I don't know if you felt any differently but yeah absolutely i think well there are a couple of things so like for hitch personally he um he loved the the german people and he loved the german culture and of course he loved german film and that's one of the right, of course of life right and um and and at the same time, he lived through the German firebombing of London in World War One, and so he understood how you know sort of how menacing and, and um, he saw the evil shadow behind all those amazing and beautiful cultural achievements, and so he had this love hate relationship with Germany himself personally, and I think right. we see that come out, and so it's very interesting that you know the. Um, you know we were treated to a couple of German songs with the little penny whistle yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's that's part of the there's no there's no extra diegetic music in the movie. There's no that's right. No score at all. 
Yeah. And so the only music we get is from the little penny whistle and a couple of German songs. And so we're, we're led to admire him. We're also led to sort of admire the cold headed uh, ferocity that um, sort of that Germanic, you know, sort of mechanistic thinking that they're so noted for uh, also leads to that they can make amazing an amazing train system that runs on time and they could build a war machine that right. would be so devastating. So I think there, there was that. And I think, you know, the other thing that was happening was, um, you know, when this was being made during, during World War II, uh, yes, it was supposed to be a propaganda piece. And in fact, uh, you know, Daryl Zanuck, the head of 20th Century Fox was off off uh, volunteering for the war himself. And that's when this when the film went into development. It was already far down the road when he came back from that. And he and he realized that what they were doing was this incredibly morally ambivalent yes. movie. And he said, we're gonna get, you know, we're gonna get our rears handed to us by the public because they're gonna see all of these ambiguities and the, the movie's not gonna do well. But they're too far along and he respected Hitch and he was clear headed enough about things to say, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and green light the movie going forward but then as it turns out you know he was right and the office of war information came out you know when the movie came out and said you might as well have just made a propaganda piece for the germans and that's part of the reason that the film flopped and it's right. not today as well known as as some of the other hitchcock films and so you know i think but they but they as you're mentioning some of the brutality so the um uh, when the film was being made, the the Germans were already in kind of a of a retreat, and um, and then the the Allied forces had gone into Germany, and they were just like bombing the hell out of out of city after city. In fact, what the Allies inflicted on cities like Dresden was called the Hiroshima of Germany. It was horrible, right. and I think we see that reflected in in Willie when they finally um, see. You know that he has betrayed them, and then mm, right. the end, like a pack of dogs, as Hitchcock told Truffaut, they, yeah. you know, they attacked him and brutally killed him. That's a scary scene. It's a, yeah, it's one of his one of yeah. the great murder scenes, you know, and uh, yeah. in Hitchcock's yeah. you know catalog, and <clears throat> and so um, you know I, you could say at least in hindsight that that's sort of a reflection of the Allied response to the Germans, right. Uh, you know, kind of in response to Nietzsche, that uh, be careful when you look in the abyss because you might see yourself staring back. Right? Exactly, and and I know that you know Hitch also he said to Truffaut that this the film was was also like a warning because you you know like the Nazis were were so organized and they had like one singular goal, and you saw that with Willy. You know, he's yeah. very organized. He's very capable. He was very um, he was very uh, calculated, and and he he was he, he was outsmarting all these people on the boat. Uh, I mean, it was interesting that he was even outsmarting me as the audience because yeah. you I found myself trusting him. Like he was amputee, amputated a leg. He was a surgeon. He was He's a nice he, guy. He was just he a was, sweet. He was being yeah. He was being he was being nice. And then when you know, and then it occurred to me, yeah, how could he be rowing this boat? for hour after hour. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even think, why didn't they search him? And no one else in the boat thought so either. What, I mean, there, he must have been doing something, which once it happens, it's so obvious. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but as, as Hitchcock said, you know, they, they, they're so organized and he, and he felt that the allies, the allies weren't, and there was, there was too much conflict and you, and that you would need, everyone needs to come together to fight the, uh, fight the Nazis. And you you really saw this you saw this in the film because there there's conflict on the boat, uh, you know, with uh, Tallulah Bankhead's character and the, the character of John, uh, you know, which you know turns into uh, somewhat of a romance in the film. But you yeah. know they're arguing like some some people think we got to kill this guy. Some people don't think they should because he's a prisoner of war. So. We have, you know, we have to follow orders. And so they're, they're you know, they're yeah. constantly butting heads. And I actually think that that worked well because in the end, yeah, they're a, they're a pack of pack of dogs, you know, when they finally kill him, but they, you know, he was betrayed them and, and he killed uh, 
uh, poor Gus. I mean, that the guy, yeah. you know, yeah. another irony is the guy he saved, he then pushes into the water. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, because, you know, as we saw, he saw him drinking water and then I, I think he figured, well, oh, I bet I'll, I'll have to just, you know, on the spur of the moment, try to convince everyone that he committed suicide. But, you know, yeah. obviously we know that that was not the case. Um, I, I just thought it, 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 it worked so, so well in terms of everybody's character being so uh, individually different, you know, like, and, 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 and complicated and a lot of nuance of behavior and, and no one, it wasn't just, cause it, it could have, this could have been very dull, I think, and simplistic to yeah. have had a clear cut villain and everyone heroic. I mean, it could have been a five minute short film, throw them off the boat, you know, but yeah. you know, we know people are never that simple, right? So well, it was a, yeah, I think Hitch conceived it as a, right from the beginning because um, he'd been thinking about it for a couple of years before it finally went into pre-production, into the writing phase. And he had conceived it as a as a microcosm film, and so you have, you know, you ha you have, for example, the German enemy, then you have, you know, Constance Porter who kind of stands in for this sort of elite, you know, uh, uh, literary class, uh, Kovac, uh, who plays her kind of love interest, and he's semi communist. At least he kind of represents a sort of labor um, labor leaning, you know, voice. Yeah. Yeah. Written House is the capitalist. And it's yeah. funny how this is one of the subtle digs that Written House is the you know Western capitalist who is he's a tycoon and he's the one who strikes up the friendship with Willie. And oh, that's right, because they're the ones getting along the most. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. funny. Yeah. Yeah, that didn't dawn on me. I kind of forgot during the film that he was so wealthy. And it's not until like they're playing the card game, him and John. Uh, that he's like, hey, you know, you, you owe me, you know, all those millions you got back at home or 50,000, whatever the, the, the sum was. And then I was like, oh, that's right. Yeah, he's the guy who's like super rich. And yeah, you're right. He's like gets the friendliest with, with yeah. the German, right? Oh, wow. Yeah. That's smart. Yeah. So it's, it's funny how like he was, it's a very, it's a very allegorical uh, movie in that sense that you have all these characters who, who fit a type. Yeah. Yeah. And but then there are these other digs like, uh, you know, Canada Lee plays Joe. He's, he's a black, he's an African-American man. And uh, you know, they're voting on what to do about Willie. Should they kill him and throw him overboard or should they save him? And he's like, and he says sarcastically, do I get a vote too? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know 1944 blacks weren't allowed to vote so right, right. Um, you know so there's all these and so then when we look at that we can wonder i think you know so it was hitch on the side of you know what what were his own politics was he left leaning you know it's kind of you would kind of think he was he was being a little bit more left or progressive liberal whatever you want to call it you think he was based on I mean, this I think film he undercuts yeah. that by showing that even the people who are air quotes more progressive in their thinking are, are also limited and of course you know in their thinking and uh, as well yeah. so i think that's a really fascinating sort of sort of mix and it and again i think this is just something that now more than ever we need these nuanced you know views of oh of yeah humanity, right yeah. yeah so again i think it's as current as as today's newspaper but I, I also wonder if a movie like that could even get made today, because I think there's as much pressure to pick sides now. Absolutely. Black ever, you know, so. Absolutely. Well, what's it, you know, I, I recently read, I had the author on my show as well, and she wrote a book about how movies depicted World War II. She mainly focused on European cinema and movies that were uh, uh, sorry, countries that were occupied by the Nazis, like Italy, like France. And, and how for a number of years you saw movies dealing with these subjects in very black and white terms. And it really wasn't until the, until the 60s and 70s that you started to see more uh, complicated and ambiguous. And, and, you know, the, as, we, as we were saying, you know, uh, people uh, compromising or collaborating in order to survive. But this film has that, certainly has those those elements as well because these people 
out of necessity. And I think survival is a really, really big part of, of the essence of the story yeah. and the war in general. Uh, out of necessity, they they do compromise with with Willie. I mean, they they allow him to take charge of the boat because he was the one who could save them, right? So yeah. it, it was did save their lives, you know. It, he did, yeah. And 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 again, that's where the irony plays because <laughs> you know you can't help but laugh. It's like some, of course, classic Hitchcock, some dark humor. You know, he's, he's, he, well, I mean, Steinbeck wrote it, but of course it probably played into the, the tastes of Hitchcock, you know, tries to kill them, then saves them. And then, but while he's saving them, plotting to get them killed or Here's sent a, to a cancer concentration camp, right? So. No, that's a, that's another funny thing. So Steinbeck was of course, famously, you know, for the people, a very populist writer, right? Grapes of Wrath and all of that. And, um, and he was brought in to write the, the original scenario for it and uh and he basically wrote a, a novella that was supposed to be the, the foundation for the film and and he wrote willie as just a, a german national but we're never sure in his story if he's an actual nazi um party member or if he's in the military we we don't know right so we just kind of have this sort of ambiguous you know sort of mood of of uh you know uh, ambiguous evil or something and so then it was later writers, probably uh, Joe Swirling, or maybe I think it was Hitchcock himself who said, no, he's got to be a Nazi. And it's going to be slowly revealed that he's not only just a Nazi, but that he's an officer. And in fact, he's the captain of the yeah. U-boat. Yeah. And so that raises all the stakes, right? Yes. And, uh, which is good, better drama, you know. Oh, uh, yeah. Better screen. And, yeah. And so, um, and, so, but, and so then it's funny that, Steinbeck distanced himself from the movie later on and I was gonna ask you about that yeah 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 so so he so he felt from what I read and correct me if I'm wrong he felt that they had made Canada Lee's part way too stereotypical or but uh, I, I thought that Canada Lee was allowed to write his own lines or something I mean do you what do you know about it yeah, I think his, um, as he was originally written, he was pretty stereotypically, uh, you know, black and, and for the time, you know, kind of given very racist, you know, language and, and lines to say. Um, and and in the movie, he still is, uh, I believe he worked in the kitchen of the ship. So he's the sort of, but at the same time, you know, I think that was just like true to the time. He yeah. Probably very likely. That's what, that's what he would be. That's what he would yeah. be doing. But right. then uh, as he, but then you're right, uh, Ken Lee protested and said, I'm not going to do this. I'm right. you know, going to rewrite these lines. And, and he sort of brought more moral character into it. But even afterwards, you know, Lee was still not, not happy with, with the outcome. He still felt it was like playing into, into some stereotypes. And there raises some questions, you know, about um, Hitchcock's own views on race. Right. And, you know, what he kind of, it's, it's so complicated um but you know was he air quotes racist or uh can we say well you know he's a product of his times and then therefore let it go but i i think my own take on it is that i would give hitchcock um you know a b <laughs> if i were grading him i'd give him a b not an a right not a, not a fail either right. um that he he was trying to to elevate you know um, the conversation, and plus you know Hitch just had this um, an aversion to stereotypical you know stock characters anyway. in general, yeah, and and so that just that impulse would have aligned with the desire to give you know Joe uh, the Candle Lee character you know more more of a, a well-rounded, you know, personality and, and character in the story. But, it, but again, he's still sort of, you know, he's the musician. He kind of plays the wise old black man, which itself is kind of a stock, you know, yeah. uh, thing. And yeah. Just, well, you know, there's, so, it's, it's interesting, you know, you know, it's for, for Hitchcock to have recognized or not necessarily recognized but been told from Canada Lee you know I'm not going to do this because it's racist or stereotypical so let me let me say what I want to say as opposed to what's written and I mean for the director in 1944 to have been like yes that's that's pretty huge I mean I can't 
you I, I, even now to go, go and tell the director, hey, I'm not going to say these lines. That doesn't go down well, you know. Um, well, it's and, yeah, especially to be, a, you know, in a powerless position. Powerless position. Is that from yeah. your, you know? This was so. his first film, too, I believe. I think so. Yeah, no, yeah. he had starred in one other film, but it was a bit part. So I think this is really his first meaty role that he had. Yeah, for sure. meaty role. And there's that other moment that Canada Lee has that was interesting was, and, and I didn't know this, but uh, Rittenhouse was referring to him as George. And apparently that's what, uh, what they called all the African-Americans who worked uh, as tenants. Like everybody was just called George. And then, and then he makes a point to say, I want to be called by my real name, Joe, uh, in the film. And I, I didn't know that, that, I mean, I guess in the day they would have known that. But yeah. that's that's interesting. So obviously that was something Canada Lee was like, you know, I'm going to show that I make up my own decisions and I'm going to stand up for myself off the top. He's the one he saves the woman with the baby, uh, you know, um, and, and you know, sure. Yeah, you're right. I mean, he, he is one of the least involved, unfortunately. Yeah. But as we said, I mean, for the for the 40s, I mean, that was a that was a big breakthrough to see you know, to see those, to, to see an African-American in, in a role like that. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting how even like in the, uh, the construction of the, of the boat and in the, uh, the camera placement. Yeah. Uh, sort of draws attention to, to these different facts. So like when you, when you, when you watch the movie and you, and you see how the characters move around in the boat, the, the bow of the boat, the pointy part is where the, the leader of the of the gang always sits the the captain so first it's written house and he sits up in the bow but then he's sort of replaced by willie who becomes the captain and he sits in the bow and then the middle of the boat is kind of like where the majority of the middle class you could say you know sits and they have sort of middle class conversations and, and uh, uh concerns and then the the stern of the boat the, the back end is the uh, what you call the the servants' quarters of the boat, and that's where you know kind of like the the food is prepared, right. and you know that's where Joe sits because he is in that in that servant class, right. and so you can all see like this schematic that was in Hitchcock's mind that you know he was going to organize the boat that way, right, and you know organize the camera placement and the shot selection around that, and then he was going to block his actors in this tiny space. Yeah. To fit that that scheme and that's right. part of what gives it is visual interest but it also i think just makes a fascinating study in how to do a heck of a lot with a yeah with a few uh ingredients you know yeah no that that's interesting that that didn't dawn on me i i also got got the impression that gus john and uh canada lee uh, i forget canada lee's character's name again uh joe yeah Joe, sorry, that's right, of course. Joe, that they all knew each other. Yeah. <laughs> I got my IMDB list handy here. Um they they were they all they they seemed like they all knew each other, like even before the war. I don't yeah. know, like they, they they talked like even when he gets Joe to go and and sir and as the Willie's sleeping to take to see if he had a compass to frisk him, because apparently he was he was uh, really, you know, he was really good at frisk at uh pickpocketing. Yeah, uh, I like that scene. He's like, no, oh, I'm not going to do that. That was, you know, when I was long time ago, I don't like stealing off people and they convinced him to do it. I got the impression that they were like buddies, the three of them. Yeah. I, I don't know yeah. if that stood out to you. Yeah, that's funny. They, It's true. Um, and then, you know, so then uh, Gus and, and um, I'm looking at it, Kovac. And they were friends also you know, as civilians are, are yeah. back on the, back in New York, I guess. And um, so, you know, Gus was a, a dancer. He was a, jitter, a competitive jitterbug dancer and he would go to these marathon yeah. you know, dance contests. And they had a, that a mutual friend who doesn't show up in the movie either, uh, who's constantly referred to as, as Gus's sort of nemesis in order to keep Rosie, his girlfriend, you know, to himself, Al Magarulian. Yeah. He's just afraid that Al Magarulian is going to steal his girlfriend if he can't dance anymore. Yeah. If he I love I love that he's willing to like, he, here he is dying of gangrene and he's like, 
well, I can't dance anymore. I'm going to lose yeah. my girlfriend. So you can't take my leg. I thought yeah. that was great. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's funny how, you know, he and Kovac have this mutual friend and uh, this, he sort of becomes a bargaining chip in their conversations. Yeah. So, and I love that, how that, that opens up the movie too. So we're introducing characters off screen who we only get to imagine. That's true. That yeah. Layer, that That's a good movie. point. And this whole, you know, this gives whole it a history between them. Yeah, yeah. That we can picture in our mind's eye, you know, even, you know, we were born long after the jitterbug era, you know, we've seen the pictures. And so we can picture in our mind's eye, you know, uh, Gus going to these jitterbugging contests for hours at a time and falling yeah. asleep in his feet or whatever. And, yeah, uh, you know, just that, that lust for life that he had. Uh, absolutely no i thought that was wonderful and i must say what a, a amazing performance particularly as they're preparing to amputate him and yeah. he's he's knocking them back to get drunk and to pass out yeah. and to go from first of all playing drunk as an actor myself is is challenging to do it really convincingly mm -hmm. but he has to he has to start to become drunk right so it's not that he just comes on screen drunk like he's looking at them you know it's all in his reactions the dread of a being amputated and then he has to go from that to drunk and that is really difficult and i thought he was so convincing yeah. all in his expression the way he spoke uh i thought it was wonderful i thought he was he was really good in it yeah, yeah, I appreciate hearing that from an actor's oh yeah perspective, you know, and yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's funny because at the time it was uh, that was another kind of a no no in movies to portray drunkenness. That was sort of a a right. thing, and and so to get him drunk was a was a coup to get around that hitch. He was able to get around the censor. Oh, sensor. because yeah, because it was it was mainly so he would he would pass out, right? So he wouldn't yeah. feel the pain of. Oh, yeah, uh, I see. Yeah, I see. That's clever. <laughs> but it makes me wonder, you know, if if uh, Hitch had in mind, you know, just sort of this, uh, you could say this dance, this antagonistic dance that he had with the censors all the time, if he almost, uh, you know, relished making, creating the scene just so that he'd go in and, and have a little, uh, you know, tango with yeah. the, the censors over it and, and prevail and yeah, well, that, that's what's so interesting about this period is how they got around the code and how some people love the challenge of having to find distinctive language or where to cut and where to, what to imply. And some people ate it up, like some writers and directors ate it up. And uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure Hitchcock was no different at times. I mean, I know that sometimes it was a headache yeah. I was I was curious what you felt about how Steinbeck and and Hitchcock handled the romances that developed in, in this film that we saw between uh, Tallulah Bankhead as Connie and John John Hodiak as John Kovac, and then the other one was uh, Mary Anderson, played by um, Alice McKenzie and um, Hume Cronin, who played Stanley. How did you feel about the um how that developed did you, well, did you that, think that worked organically or yeah it was so that was another thing that i don't think uh steinbeck had any of that romance in there that was added in later so uh after after steinbeck was was uh ended his run with the film and you know hitch wasn't really happy with how things turned out he turned to a couple of other writers the main credited writer on the film was joe swirling joseph swirling and uh, and he oh. was this, uh, you know kind of a cigar chewing writer. You know you can just see him you know hacking away at his Underwood typewriter, just cranking out you know page after page of of scene and dialogue. And he was kind of a fixer in that way. He could come in and, and save movies that were kind of going off the rails. That was his reputation. And and so he and Hitch got along uh, very well. But Alma was very much part of the script development process. She, she was on contract, uh, you know, on salary for part of the time in the development. Uh, she also volunteered a lot of hours. And, uh, and Ben Hecht was brought in as well to, um, you know, punch up some of the dialogue. So, but everybody said, and so what happened was after the movie was over and released, then they were sued by a writer who said that they stole their 
ideas about Lifeboat from him. Oh. And so what we end up with is our, our pages of court transcript describing, you know, the, uh, the examination and cross-examination of Hitchcock and, and Joe and, and some of the writers who got credit for what, when, and how for all these different situations. And, um, and it's a very, it's a rare look into how the collaborative process work because most times we just don't have that kind of record. Right, right. So, so there are a couple of things. One is uh, Swirling insisted that Hitchcock could have, if he'd wanted to, uh, gotten based on, a, on an original story by Alfred Hitchcock, that the ideas were so you know, original to him that he should have gotten, you know, he could have gotten on-screen credit. He never did. That just wasn't his MO, but he could have done that. So it gets complicated. Uh, it was Hitch who, you know, devised, you know, who turned the German into a Nazi. It was probably Hitch uh, or Hitch and Alma. This is very vague, you know, uh, that, who came up with these, with these romances that, that develop. And so, uh, and there's one other writer who Hitchcock wouldn't even mention, but it was his idea to give Constance Porter a diamond ring that he turns into the diamond bracelet, which figures prominently in the movie. So these, I, these relationships, like between um, Constance Porter, she's a society woman, she's of a certain age, you know, she's yeah. not a young starlet type. Um, and 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 then the younger, hunkier, you know, um, Kovac. It's it's kind of a love hate relationship. Yeah, and yeah. I think they kind of get off on that, and that is like so Hitchcock. You can draw a direct line between that couple and the sort of love hate relationship between Mister and Missus Smith, and oh, right. the, and the sort of love hate relationship um, between the um, main couple in Family Plot. So right. in my mind, that's totally Hitchcock. Yeah, and um, and then the other one that it's it's a much more sweet scene, you know, or, or situation between Stanley and the and the girl who's an, a nurse, and um, but even that, you know, is like uh, I think it's very Hitchcockian. He's constantly playing with her hair, and uh, she's got a little bow in her hair, and he's constantly untying it. And again, she kind of gets annoyed with it, but she lets him because there's a little, you know, little romance happening. Yeah. So, um, and that even that scene uh, reminded me of of a scene from The Pleasure Garden, 1925, Hitchcock's first movie, and and this kind of lecherous guy at at a dance hall theater goes up to um, to Jill and uh, says starts playing with her hair and says, "I like your hair. Can I have a can I have a lock for safekeeping?" And she takes it out. It's a hairpiece. And she says, here, you can have it. <laughs> and he goes, you, you know, but, uh, you know, I think Hitch had, I think this is overstating it. Um, the language isn't perfect, but, uh, you know, I think he had, some people would say he had a hair fetish. And, oh. You know, so I think it's an expression of that. But, well, like, but, but, I, but I love the complication of these romances. Yeah. That, Evolve for sure. Yeah, me too. Me, you, because it's so you know it's so difficult. I find particularly in war films, the ones you know a lot of the ones I've seen when there has been some kind of love story in the middle of it, it feels it often will feel very like tacked on. Like the some producer came in and said, "Hey, we need some. You got to have something light or sexy in here or sweet." Exactly. And even though it's like you know, in this, in, you know, the midst of something as horrendous as World War II, but here um, it was done so organically because they were all, at one point thought they were all going to die, you know, the, the storm coming and John kisses Tallulah Bankhead and, and he says, well, we may as well go down together, you know, and he gives her a big kiss and uh, he says something like that. And, and, um, she later on, you know, she says something interesting to him. It's like, it's more personal to die together than to live together. <laughs> and it really made me think, she says something like that. I'm not quoting, quoting exactly, but sure. it really made me think because I thought, you know, that's a good point. You know, I mean, none of us know what it's like to die with someone. I mean, only people who know that are gone and they can't tell us, but they were, they, they were feeling that it was going to happen. So 
that I could understand how that would have led to, you know, you see them, uh, you know, she's like hugging him or cuddling him and they're playing with each other's feet a little bit um, and kissing. And, and then, you know, because there's this love hate, as soon as she's bragging about her bracelet, he pushes her off because he hated how superficial she was at the same time, you know, right off the beginning, she's, you know, she's so concerned with her appearance and her clothes and she keeps losing, you know, her typewriter goes off and the camera goes into the boat. And then of course, later on the bracelet, when they yeah. they used it uh, to try to get a fish as bait. Um, and he, he couldn't stand that about her, but then he was so attracted to her at the same time. I just thought it worked so organically. And even with the other two, you know, like, cause you know, there were quieter moments at night where the calm was sea and sorry, the, the sea was calm. And, mm. uh, you know, you see Alice talk about how she was in love with this other man who had two children and she couldn't yeah. do anything about it. And Hume, Isn't that interesting. Yeah. I that's another, that. one the, yeah. another one of the outside stories that takes place off screen. And I, yeah. Like, like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Works so well. Cause that can be, you know, in a one, setting film if you're going to do that it could be very challenging to not make it feel like you just tacked it on but i thought they did it in such a kind of pragmatic way because yeah there is going to be moments where it's just bored and still and waiting and things are going to happen and you know and 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 hume is very uh sympathetic and he's listening and he's attentive and you know, I, I just thought it was very well done. I just yeah. thought it was really, really, it didn't feel phony or tacked on at all. Yeah, it, it just occurred to me that um, I think there are, there is a moment in the scene, in the movie where uh, there's no wind, they're kind of lost at sea, and they're in the doldrums, right? They're just, it's a, they're, they're bored as a crew, or, or yes. as a, the cast and crew of, of this boat, and, um, but we don't, we don't lose the tension of the film. Right. And you can imagine how in real life, you know, in those moments where, especially if it's hour after hour, day after day, uh, you're, it's the boredom becomes, uh, itself becomes menacing, but you never really, you're always pulled along in the story. Yeah, absolutely. But, and, it, and it's so funny, like these little Hitchcock touches, like uh, I loved, <clears throat> you know, watching, watching her slowly be, um, uh, her persona, her perfection is is whittled away and it's, and yeah. it's eroded over the course of the film. Yeah. And 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 what what's revealed is is a uh, a woman, a person of character, you right. know. She and that's that's kind of a flowering that that happens. And I think that's really beautiful. But but you know, it's, I think we might have talked about this in our last conversation. I love the business with the camera because she she goes on and on about how she caught. All, yeah. all of this valuable footage and it was going to make her famous and she's going to make money on it and it was just amazing and it's she's she's behaving very um what's the carnivorously towards the the footage that she has gobbled yeah. up with her camera yeah and that rubs you know um go <laughs> john back. yeah he's like and, he was not and, having it and it's yet again another example in a hitchcock film of that the cameras are depicted as you know, weapons of, of destruction. Mm-hmm. And if you see a camera in a film, it's never neutrally deployed and it's never, you know, depicted in a positive light. Rear window being the most obvious example. Ah, uh, good point. Good point. And, yeah. But over and over and over and over again, if you see a camera, it's bad. Right. Which is an ironic statement on his own. <laughs> As a filmmaker, yeah. I love that opening shot where she's alone. It's in the so film. good coat and it's just <laughs> you know destruction all around her and she's in like perfect condition like i, I was like how did she not yeah. it was like she anticipated something was going to happen and she must have got in the boat before it even happened i don't know i don't know what because like, everyone else was like a mess they were like oil all over them and yeah, <laughs> yeah she must have lowered herself into the water or something yeah, yeah. and she was only it's... thinking of herself right like you know obviously yeah. like why not grab some maybe she didn't have the time to but yeah. Uh, you know, in that kind of situation, you know, you want to get out, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I, loved, I thought that was it. Yeah, Hitchcock yeah. was, uh, he was a sur- surrealist, right? And so he loved yeah. taking these incongruent elements and smashing them together. I know that, you know, obviously morals, it plays a big part of this film, as it does in a lot of Hitchcock's films. And 
I think ultimately the, the, and I think at the end, they throw it back to the audience in a way, because, you know, that other, now they're, they're about to be saved and, you know, well, they, they were about to be captured by Germans and then in the nick of time, they were saved uh mm. by the allies and so one of the Ger- you know this the, the germans get bombed and this one now another german that little kid uh he's maybe you know in his late teens he gets in the boat and now they're in this position again and and he, and as myself uh, myself i was thinking throw this guy back in the water uh but you know actually you know it was it was you know mainly the women women who were like oh, he's just a kid you know come on let's and right away, everyone else is like, you know, chuck them off, get them out. And and then he says in German, aren't you going to kill me? And then John says something along the lines of, what do you say to a person like that? You know, who's who's saying, yeah. why don't you, why don't you kill me? And then Tallulah Bankhead mentions, you know, you'd have to ask Gus and the other woman with the baby who, who both died, uh, ask yeah. them, you know, and I, and I really think he's, they're throwing that also at us. You know, what, what do you do? Like, just because this is the, 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 uh, the enemy, do you, do you just execute them? Do you just kill them? Uh, Or do you, you know, do the right thing and make him a prisoner of war and arrest and do, you know, bring him to the proper authorities and, and stuff like that, you know? So I don't know if that's how you felt in terms of uh, the moral dilemmas in the, in the piece. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, Hitch is handing it back to the audience. The, the, I think the line is, and I, I might be botching it too, but it, it's, uh, what are you going to do with people like that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, you know, um, it, there, there is no answer. Like, it's tough. Uh, it's it, a, you it's, know, what it, we may do what we need to do to survive, but then those choices um, could, in certain situations, be inevitably morally compromising. Right. So right. There there is no there is no good answer. Yeah. Nobody, yeah. Nobody it, it's yeah. it's very, very complicated. And I, I'm still wrestling with it. You know, I've been it's been on my mind because it's uh it's a it's a tough film in a lot of ways. Are there any uh, you know uh Hitchcock visual touches you picked up on, like things that he did? You know, as we know, he was known for his POV shots. He was known for using a lot of uh, uh, visual motifs and things like that. Is there anything that you picked up on on here that was like a classic Hitchcock shot? Yeah, there are, there are a few, that, like the camera, you know, scene, you know, just mentioned. Um, yeah, right. A couple of things, like one, uh, when, when Willie has finally taken the captain's position in the boat and he's running things, there's that, and it's a very famous shot, and I could probably even recreate it here on this camera of him rowing the boat with yes. his fists in the foreground, pulling yeah. like this, and it's just a, uh, a visual sort of a telegraph of of uh power the power, power the u- ubermensch right right um right the other thought that i shot that i just um i've always enjoyed this about the film because it's uh it's a sort of a prelude to the opening scene of rear window and um so the opening credits take place uh they roll over this giant black smokestack yeah. billowing and the smokestack is sinking into the water because it's the sinking ship they've been on and then as it passes away we see the wreckage and then the camera moves in and i'll have to go back and look but i think it feels like it's all a single shot it is yeah and and then we we see the story of the destruction being told we see this bloated drowned body float by which is kind of horrific even by today's standards to me anyway you know and then we see it we see the new yorker magazine floating by so this indicates you know that we're kind of on the eastern seaboard and blah 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 you know a lot of things in turn interpret there and right oh and then we finally get to the boat uh, to the lifeboat itself and um i just love the way he's visually setting up that story and originally the the original screenplay i think this might have been steinbeck's idea was to sort of go meta on it and and have a scene take place in a theater um, about a war film and then we transition from that theater scene to to the lifeboat because you have to remember that like in this time in, in wartime like the thousands upon thousands of lifeboats were deployed from sunken ships like this is a common story you know right. it was in the news right. and so we're going to play on that so hitch 
hitch ditched that whole sort of opening scene in the theater and uh, saved 150,000 bucks by just start, starting in the water. <laughs> right. So set the whole yeah. thing up. Just, yeah. So it looks so simple and so obvious in hindsight, but so well thought through. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, and again, it's all, you know, he's communicating that whole opening visually without any dialogue. Like, you know, as you said, we see the boat sink and then we see just scattered of, you know, newspapers and furniture and all kinds of things, just like in the beginning of Rear Window, as you pointed out, we get to know uh, Stewart's character uh, by, you know, the smash camera, the photographs, and now we, we, we now are putting together who, uh, who this person is or things about him and, and what's happened, you know, there he is with a cast, right? So you're putting it together visually as opposed to being told. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that really popped out to me as well. The other, the other, uh, there's a really beautiful uh, moving shot in this uh, where again, and, and I know, and you know, Hitchcock often did this where characters will be saying, say, saying something, but he's focusing on something else. So, you know, he wants the, uh, you know, the, 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 the dialogue is irrelevant as opposed to what he's trying to tell the viewer to look at. And it's when the, the, the young woman whose baby died, uh, suddenly he zooms in on her and, and her arms are just out like this with now, you know, empty because she was carrying that baby, you know, for you know, since the baby's been born, right? And now she's still holding that pose of uh, carrying a baby and the baby's gone. I just thought that was brilliant and, and so devastating at the same time. Yeah. 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 Another some other fun touches were like just pure vintage Hitchcock, and you know where he constantly reminds us that he's the storyteller, that it's that it is a movie that he's the storyteller, and and his mastery is that it doesn't take you out of the movie, it doesn't relieve any of the suspense or emotion, and and so of course you know there's the famous cameo that he, he shows up on a newspaper in a weight reduction ad for reduction. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and that he, that was his favorite. That's probably for many people, that's their favorite of his cameos. I love that. But, I'll just show, I have it here in the book in the Hitchcock true foe. Uh, and, and as he said, apparently people were calling in and asking about huh. this company here, uh, Reduco, I believe they're called uh, because yeah. Hitch has lost a lot of weight, which he used in the shot, right? One where he's really big yeah. and then the other where he's, slimmer and everyone and people who are overweight were like how do i get who's this, what is this company I I gotta... <laughs> and you know how he lost his weight he okay so backing up a little bit his his mother had died in uh just about a, a year earlier or so and then a couple of months before he started on the movie his brother died oh, and so it was a, know that. a rough year for him you know and um and so he'd, he'd gotten up to 300 pounds. He was really overweight and struggling wow. with his weight, you know, just struggling to get around things. And so uh, he finally resolved to, you know, shed some pounds. And he basically, he went on the keto diet. He just cut oh. out the, the carbs. He said oh. his diet for months at a time, you know, was uh, he had a cup of coffee for breakfast and a steak and salad for dinner. That was it. Wow. Yeah. So it's yeah. kind of funny, you know, like uh, we tout the Atkins diet and the keto diet, but now nah, it's, you know, it's been around for, for decades. Nothing is new and it worked. Wow. He, he yeah. dropped pounds and he did lose a lot of weight. Yeah. I, I suppose his weight always kind of fluctuated, mm -hmm. right? Cause he was always pretty, he was probably pretty stocky, but never as big as he wasn't, as you see in this picture, the before shot. Yeah, he he kind of yo-yo, yeah. but I think he was always sort of disposed to to be a heavier person for whatever reason, you know. And um, so he was always struggling to keep his weight down. Right, right. But later on in life, as he got into his seventies and approached his decline, there he was, you know, pretty. He was yeah. struggling. Uh, yeah. With his I just wanted to mention, you know, I just like as I said, I, I thought the performances were just were spectacular. I thought everybody. Uh, was great uh, and as I as I already mentioned uh, William uh, Bendix but but Tallulah Bankhead I mean she's so funny but also had a real a real flair for uh, drama as well I mean I I just you know I thought she was I don't know her work too well but I thought she just really stood out in this film I don't know how you felt yeah. about her or anyone else 
yeah she so um the, she she was herself in that movie uh hitch just wrote her lines for the Tallulah Bankhead he knew not for the Constance Porter this fictional person and in fact she even complained at some point she said you're not asking me to your act you're just telling ask me to be myself and so even her, <laughs> her accent you know, her her darlings yeah. and her sort of you know that was just her and she yeah. she had actually wanted to take a more of a a more of a fictional role but he but he had said no no what i want is you i want the real you right. so and then she right. just inhabited it so well and you know, there are a couple other you know of course we already talked about gus and willie but the other thing you know the the one that just cracked me up was uh john hodiak as as kovac and he spends he's a hunky dude and he spends really, yeah. a movie with his shirt off yeah. flash sex and yeah. and he's got this like this this shit-eating grin on his face all the time and um it is just like so natural and so like i don't know it's just i know guys like that yeah and, yeah uh, he was really i i really enjoyed him as well uh yeah. i thought i thought everyone was just was really really wonderful in this was there anything else uh, you uh, you wanted to mention about this film um okay so then you know one last uh, we could talk for hours about this film it's yeah. a masterpiece yeah. capital it really is it really is but the the other uh bit of it is kind of getting back to this uh lack of music uh, no you know no extra diegetic music and hitchcock said yeah we're out in a lifeboat would you expect to see a, an orchestra you know off right. camera of course not so um so that was the rationale for it but the but it is scored in a way because the wind and the weather and the rain uh, good point you know provide musical score that's analogous once again to the birds yeah and then, and then we're we're sort of uh we get our sort of mood also attenuated by by the music and so we see uh, joe playing his little whistle at some points and then of course the german music um and and it's beautiful it's, it's just kind of fun and natural and i i i you know it's i forgot you know you could barely you're right because he used you know the wind and the rain and the storms and you know joe playing the instrument and willie singing and um it feels like there's a score and and i know that he really went to great lengths to make it so realistic with the you know the boat rocking like you really feel like you're on a boat i mean it's it's quite it's quite stunning like you feel like you're in the middle of that ocean with them like they were getting seasick and i read that yeah life like yeah <laughs> i know i know it must have been yeah some of them were getting pneumonia and it, yeah but they but this was like on a set like it wasn't like they went out in the ocean but still i suppose the rocking and the, the temperatures and of the water and stuff like that so yeah you yeah spend all day wet you know drenched in water to yeah. get the get, get the scene and yeah so, yeah that yeah. rear projection again it's just like masterful it's really it's so good um, it's so so good i mean dare, dare i say this you know to me like i said it's it's uh, I mean, I, my, my favorite movies change all the time, but, uh, you know, it's, it's probably certainly one of my favorites, uh, of his, uh, I, I, you know, I know it's, it's, it's difficult to peg this down sometimes, but does it, does it fall anywhere for you on like a top five or a top 10 in terms of Hitchcock? That's, that's tough. Uh, I would yeah, definitely put it, I would, I would definitely put it in the upper tier of top, uh, top five or 10. Yeah. For sure. So if anyone hasn't seen it, uh, I highly recommend it. I know Keno Lorber put it out on Blu-ray. Uh, so you can you can get the Blu-ray and it's also available on various streamers uh, as well. Well, Joel, thanks so much for taking the time to come on. Really, I really, really appreciate it. My pleasure, thank you, my honor. Where's, uh, where's the best place for people to find you? I think the best thing that people can do is you can go, uh, if you want to find me on Facebook, it's uh, facebook.com slash Hitchcock Geek, two words, Hitchcock Geek. Uh, the other thing is uh, join my mailing list because we're doing events throughout the month. We're doing right. two online movie screenings plus one lecture usually given by me. Although this Wednesday, it will be by uh, the lovely Chris Madrid French speaking on Hitchcock and architecture. So what you'll need to do to get into these events, though, is go to hitchcon.org. So H-I-T-C-H-C-O-N, hitchcon.org, and pop me a note. Get on the email list. 
and then you'll be you'll be in the flow. You can quit the list at any time, and I promise not to to spam you and do bad things with your. <laughs> awesome, great. Yes, well, we're along to the party. Yeah, no, that's yeah, because and I've been tuning into those weekly uh, um, live talks when I can, and they're always really engaging and and educational and fun. So, yeah, I highly recommend uh, checking those out for sure. And I will leave the links in the description box below for where you can uh, follow Joel's uh, writing and get in touch with him as well. So Joel, thanks again. And please, uh, let's do it again sometime. Absolutely. Can't wait. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching and or listening. If you are currently listening to this on the audio version of my YouTube channel. If you've run out of episodes to listen to on the audio version, head over to the YouTube channel where every single episode that I've ever recorded can be found youtube.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies. I want to thank all of my members on Patreon. If you're interested in becoming a member of my Patreon, head over to patreon.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies for full details. Patreon is bonus content that I create month in and month out. And it is based on polls that I put out at the beginning of every single month, which means that you will be very much a part of the decision making as to what I do on Patreon month in and month out because of course you will have access to those polls in order to vote. Patreon is a great way for content creators such as myself to earn an additional income and it will give me more flexibility to do even more videos and episodes on my YouTube channel. So it's of course everything on YouTube or audio version is, is accessible and absolutely free for people to listen to. So if you like my work, and you're interested in supporting me on Patreon, head over to the link, patreon.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies for full details. And lastly, if this is your first time here, please consider subscribing to my channel by pressing the Robert Bellissimo at the movies logo. You will see it floating above my head in the top left corner to your top left in just a second. Just click on that and then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release one of my new videos or when I go live. Thank you so much, everyone. I will see you in the next episode.